this week's episode, I want to show you a few different ways that you can integrate Twitter into a Rails app. Let's start off with something simple here. Uh, on this page, what I would like to do is add some quotes from Twitter users on the side, uh, saying good things about this application. But I want some easy way to do this and add quotes through Twitter itself. One way to do this is through favorites. You can set up a Twitter account for your app. In this case, I'll demonstrate using my Railscast account. And then you can just star various tweets that you want to show up as quotes on the page. So with this done, all we have to do is find some way to fetch and display these tweets on that page. Now, Twitter provides some widgets that make it very easy to do this. There's a faves widget, which we can display favors for a given account. And you can just configure all the settings here. And then once you do, just click finish and grab code, and it will give you an HTML snippet. So going into the view template of my Rails application, I'll just paste in the code snippet wherever I want to display that widget. And now when we reload the page, there are quotes. Couldn't be simpler. But this isn't all that flexible. What if we want to have a little more control over the look and feel of this, and we don't want to require the user to make a separate request to Twitter to fetch the quotes? Well, in that case, we'll need to interact with Twitter directly from our Rails application, and that's what I want to focus on for the rest of this episode. Now we'll be communicating with Twitter through its REST API, so it helps to check out the documentation and familiarize yourself with what you can do here. For example, there's a section on favorites, which we can use to fetch favorites for a given user. And there are various options which you can pass in here, and a nice example demonstrated here, so we can try this out, and just filling in whatever screen name we want, such as Railscast, and then that will make a JSON response, giving you all the details about the various uh, tweets uh, that are favorited by that user. Now we could make the request and parse the JSON response on our own, but why do all of that work when the Twitter gem will do it for us? This makes it really easy to communicate with Twitter's REST API directly from Ruby. Let me show you how it works. I'll start by adding this to the bottom of my gem file, just gem Twitter. Now to keep this episode up to date, I'm going to uh, be using version 3.0.0, which is currently in release candidate 1, but most of what I'm going to be showing you will work fine in version 2 as well. So you'll need to run the bundle command to install this. A good place to look for documentation on this gem is the Rdocs for the Twitter client class. This has a whole list of methods which you can call which line up nicely with the API. So for example, there's this favorites method here, which you can use to fetch uh, favorites for a given user. And that's really what I'm interested in here. So let's try this out in the console, calling twitter.favorites here and passing in a username such as Railscast. And I can pass in options as well, setting account to maybe only one here just to fetch one tweet. And once it makes a request, it'll get that tweet back. And let's see um, what that information contains. So we can call text on a Twitter status to see the message content or uh, see what the unique identifier is or fetch when it was uh, created or maybe grab information about the user, such as their name, uh, their screen name, or maybe even their uh, profile image URL to display their image, and so on. So let's apply this to the view. Instead of displaying the widget, I'll paste in some code to loop through all the favorite tweets for Railscast. I'll just display three of them and output the text and the user's screen name. And now when I reload the page, uh, there are the quotes which I'm fetching through the API, and I've already styled this off camera. Now there are several problems with doing it this way. When I call twitter.favorites, it's going to make a request to the Twitter API right then and there, which is happening in the middle of the user's request. This could really slow down the request or make it not work at all. And we also really have to be aware of Twitter's rate limiting. So Twitter has some pretty strict limitations on how often you can call their API. For unauthenticated requests, which is what we've been doing, is 150 times per hour. But if you authenticate, which I'll talk about later, you can do 350 requests per hour. Now, if you want to see how many more requests you can make, you can call Twitter.RateLimitStatus to get more information about your given limit. So this tells you how many you can make, how many you have left, and when it will be reset. Pretty useful. To get around this limit, we can add some kind of caching so this API request doesn't need to happen every time. Probably the easiest way is with some fragment caching. Just add a cache call into here. Let's call it testimonies and a block, and then end it down here. And I'll just toss in today's date in there as well, so that way it auto-expires each day. 
So with this in place, the only time the Twitter API is triggered is the first request of each day, which does solve a lot of problems, but I still feel uneasy about the solution, because what if Twitter is down during the time, this cache will never get generated, and suddenly this page is not working for every user that comes to it. And uh, falling back to an older cache with this kind of setup is really tricky and messy. So instead, I prefer to cache this in the database. So I'm going to generate a model for this, I'll call it testimony, and I'll store the tweet ID, and how about the user screen name, and also the content of the message, which will be text. And you can add what other attributes you want to store about the tweet in here as well. And I'll migrate the database. So now I have this testimony model, and I need some way to create new records for each favorited tweet. I'm going to paste in the code for this because it's nothing special. I just call Twitter favorites and loop through each of those tweets and then make sure that one doesn't already exist for that given tweet ID. And if it doesn't, then we create a new testimony record given those uh, tweet attributes. I'm just going to trigger this method from the Rails console to uh, populate the database here, but you can really do it wherever you want. You might want to toss it in a rake task and call it through cron, or maybe use uh, the rescue scheduler gem and uh, set it up with a background process, or really however often you, need, you think you need to call it. So this ended up inserting a new testimony record for each favorited tweet. Now if I call that same method again, it's not going to generate any more records because they already exist. However, this Twitter API call is still returning the tweets that we've already added here. So if you want to reduce the amount of content returned, you can pass in the since ID option and set it to the uh, latest tweet ID, which is the maximum tweet ID, and that will really reduce the amount of content that's coming back. Now all that's left to do is display these testimonies in the view. So back in the template here, instead of doing this mess, we could just loop through each of the uh, testimonies. I'll just limit it to three, and then display the content and screen name in there. And you might want to move this off into some kind of name, name scope to clean up the view. And now when I reload the page, it looks the same. So nothing's changed from the user's perspective, but since the tweets are served from the database, Twitter could go down entirely and it wouldn't affect the user at all. And this is more flexible. We could add testimonies from other sources, uh, maybe edit one and just take a snippet of the, the quote and so on. Now, so far, all of the requests we've made to the Twitter API have been unauthenticated, but what if you need to access private content or maybe post tweets? Well, in that case, you'll need to let Twitter know about your application first by going to dev.twitter.com and clicking on create an app and then filling out the form here. Now, once you do, you can go to my applications and check out the details for this. So in order to make authenticated requests to the API, we need to supply both the consumer key and consumer secret. And in order to act as a Railscast user, we need to also supply the access token here and the access token secret. Now notice this is read and write permissions, which you can customize under the settings for the application. You can set whatever uh, default permission type you want your application to be. Now, if you check out the README for the Twitter gem, you can see those authentication tokens can be passed in through a configure block, which you can just do inside of a Rails initializer. So I'll make a new initializer file under the config initializers directory and call it uh, twitter.rb. And I'll just paste in the code for this configuration block. And this just sets all the authentication keys based on environment variables, which I'm going to set elsewhere. By the way, this entire initializer file will be unnecessary in uh, future versions of the Twitter gem because it will automatically look in these given environment variables for the authentication. So with that in place, all API requests will now be authenticated. We can try this out by calling favorites and not passing in a username. We'll just set the count to one and it will automatically default to the current user, which is a Railscast user. And since I have write access, I can even post a tweet in here, twitter.update, pass in a message and there we go. And visiting my Twitter account, you can see the tweet there. So we know how to authenticate as the owner of the application, but how do we access the Twitter API as a user signed into our app? For example, off camera, I added the ability for a user to sign in through Twitter here. Uh, I did this with OmniAuth exactly like I show in episode 241. So when I click on this, I can sign in as our Bates in this case to this application, and I'm giving this app permission to uh, post tweets as me because I have read and write permissions on this app. And when I click sign in, it should take me back to the app, and it does, now I'm signed in as our Bates. So the question is, how does the app access the Twitter API through this our Bates account? As you may know, when signing in through OmniAuth, it provides a hash of details about the user that's signing in. And I'm passing this hash to this user 
from OmniAuth class method in this app. And let's inspect this hash to see what it contains. I'll just raise it in a two YAML format. So now when I click sign in with Twitter again, it's going to take me immediately back to my application since I've already authorized this app. And this raises that OmniAuth hash, which contains some interesting information, specifically the credentials here, which contains the OAuth token and secret, which I can use to authenticate as this user through the Twitter API. Now I'll need to store these values in the user record so I can access them later. So I'm going to generate a migration for adding a OAuth, let's call it to the user's table. So let's call it an OAuth token, which is a string value and an OAuth secret, also a string. And then I'll migrate the database to add those two columns to the user's table. So going back to the user model, we need to set these columns when the user signs in. Now we could do it just when creating the user record, but I prefer to do it every time they sign in, so that way in case the token gets reset or something, it will be up to date. So this will return a user record, which we can set the OAuth token to the auth credentials and the token value here, and also set the secret to the auth secret, and then save the user record. Oh, and also I need to make sure to uh, return the user record. Now this method is getting a little bit uh, long and complex, so you might want to extract part of it out and do some refactoring, but I'll leave that to you. So with this in place, we can access a Twitter API through this user's credentials, and we can do that. I'm just going to generate a new method here called Twitter, and generate a new Twitter client instance, and you can pass in various options into here for authentication, such as the OAuth token setting, which will be the user's OAuth token attribute, and the OAuth token secret is going to be set to the user's OAuth secret attribute. And I also want to cache this in an instance variable. And uh, let's only do this if the provider equals Twitter, because we might want to add multiple forms of authentication and only access the Twitter API if that is what they use to sign in. So now I need to sign in through Twitter again, so that way it stores those token and secret values. So let me demonstrate how you can access a Twitter API now from this user. So let me fetch that user, which is the first record here. That's the user I signed in as. And now I have this Twitter method, which I can call, which will return a Twitter client. And I can call methods on this, just like I've been doing on the Twitter gem so far. I can see the favorites. I can call update and post tweets as that user. And let's just access the current user uh, screen name here, just so you can see that I'm signed in as that user uh, through Twitter. Now, a quick word about requiring read write access for your app. Uh, be careful not to abuse this. And if you are posting tweets under someone's account, make sure that they know about it and that they can see the full message before authorizing it, because it really can give an app a bad name. And if your app can work just as a read-only app, I recommend sticking with that because for me personally, if I try to authenticate through Twitter and I see I'm giving them access to post my account, that'll just uh, turn me away and I'll usually just leave the site and not uh, continue on through it. So you might want to stick with read-only unless being able to write to the Twitter account is really fundamental to your app. Now, Twitter allows you to change your app permissions dynamically when a user signs in. And here's how you can do that with OmniAuth. Uh, this sign in with Twitter link here just points to auth slash Twitter, which OmniAuth responds to. And you can pass in a special parameter in, parameter in here called x auth access type and set that to read or write or whatever you want to change the permissions to. And so this will bring me to Twitter. And since I set it to read, I only have read access uh, for this application. So signing in here will only allow me to uh, access the Twitter user's account with read permissions. So this is really handy if you want to have different Twitter permission settings for different types of users. And that's all I have for this episode on integrating with Twitter. Thanks for watching.